I kind of feel like I'm a guest speaker. I've not been in the pulpit for four weeks. My goodness. Been biting at the bullet sitting there on the front row while Pastor Dina has been ministering. Uh, I start, started this series called 2020, Seeing the Way God Sees. God, I believe, spoke that to me back in October. At first, I kind of bucked even doing it because I thought, my gosh, we're going into the year 2020 and how cliche it'll be to get up and say, well, the Lord spoke to me that the year 2020 is that we're to have 2020 vision. You know, people say, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> but seriously, that is what he spoke to me. And then come to find out that there's several other people in the body of Christ that we esteem and follow have similar messages that they've been sharing in the body of Christ uh, traveling ministers that seeing the way God sees is so vitally important, especially the day and age that we live in. So I'm just going to continue on in that this morning, pick up where she left off. I'm not going to review what she's ministered on, but the bulk of it was is that before you can see the way God sees, you have to see God the way he is. Because you can't really see the way God sees things unless you see God through the right light or through the right lenses. And, and Pastor Dina shared a bunch of things about how many of us grew up not seeing God appropriately or rightly, uh, the way the Word says who He is, well, the traditions and doctrine of men of, that make the Word of God of none effect or render it powerless, one translation say, meaning the ideas that man comes up with. And most of the time, the reason why those traditions or those doctrines or the ideas that man come up with and have a tendency to filter into the body of Christ or into the church is because they begin to try to explain God through their own personal experiences or most of the time, lack of experience. Really, people begin to then form their own view of who God is instead of going back to the Bible and saying whether I've experienced this or haven't experienced it doesn't change the fact that God is true to his word and this is who he is. Amen. And that can be challenging sometimes, especially when you're facing difficulties in your life. When you're facing those mountains and you're facing those valleys and you're facing those pains, whether it's emotional pains or actual physical pains or whatever, and it doesn't seem like God's coming through. And in those difficult times, when it doesn't seem like God's coming through, when it doesn't seem like we're seeing God the way the Word says He is, we begin to then adjust our seeing to accommodate our lack of receiving or lack of experiencing the goodness of God. But how many know that the Word of God is clear? The Word of God is absolute. There are no gray areas in the Word of God. And if something in our life begins to get out of focus, we need to focus back in on the absoluteness of God. It's kind of like, it's kind of like when, when you wear glasses, I wear glasses so I can use this analogy, it's kind of like when you wear glasses, and you take them off, and it's like, I can see things, but I can't see them clearly. And because I can't see them clearly, I have to work at trying to make them out, like that, that sign back there above the doors. I have to try, and I, I squint, and I got to try, and, and as, I, as I look at it, I can begin to make out some of it, and if you've ever not wore glass or not been able to see something that you're seeing, even those that don't that don't wear glasses, if something gets too far out of sight, if God gets too far out of your vision, if, if you let God get too far out of your vision, you're not staying close to him. Remember, the Bible says, draw nigh unto God. If you let God get too far out of your vision, all of a sudden, you'll start to try and interpret and maybe even guess. It's like, well, I, I think it says... And then you walk up and go, wow, that isn't what it said at all. And that's what happens many times when we're, we're trying to see God and we've taken our eyes off of the truth of God's word and now we're trying to interpret what we're seeing and we're squinting and we're looking and it's like, and, and how do you see God clear? How You draw nigh unto him or you, you put, uh, for me, in the natural, I put my glasses on to see something. It's like, oh, there it is, maximum capacity, 232 persons. Not a problem. 
Well, how do you do that spiritually? You narrow in on the Word of God. You focus in on the Word of God. You make those adjustments on the Word of God. I'll never forget because I wear glasses. Someone told me one time when you don't have glasses, they said, just, just go like this, make a real small, small deal and look. And it's just like without my glasses, maximum capacity, 232 persons. I can see it almost as clear as I can with my glasses on. Because when you narrow your focus, when you, narrow, when, when, you, when you focus in on the things of God, what does it mean to focus in on the things of God? When you focus, when you narrow your focus, do you know I can't, when I'm looking through that tiny little hole right there, do you know I can't see anything else? You've got to take your eyes off of the things that are around you sometimes. You've got to narrow your focus out. You want to see the way God sees? You've got to stop looking at everything around you. Everybody, most everybody in here, I know there's a few that's not because I know Amy's got family that, that aren't from, from Southern California. But most of us in here have, that live in the Southern California area and live close to the coast, Lord showed me this back last week. It's kind of like, uh, how, how many have, have experienced or know what the marine layer is that comes in? We all know what the marine layer is. Amen? How many know that when the marine layer comes in, the sun didn't go anywhere? It just got covered up. Well, do you know when you're distracted with too many things in life, it's the marine layer. But yet we start to think and start to question, God, where'd you go? I can't see you anymore, God. And God's like, I didn't go nowhere. <laughs> Do you know that the, when the marine layer comes in, the sun is shining just as bright yes, on the top side yes, yes. as it always was. It's just that there's things that come in. Well, do you know there's things that can come into your life, distractions that can come into your life, concerns and cares and worries. And sometimes, and I, I, I want to say this, sometimes it even, it even concerns and carries and worries. Preachers too many times, and I'm guilty of it, we always go to the negative that, you're, oh, you're just carrying concerns and cares and worries. No, sometimes it's just things you shouldn't be doing right now, and it's taking over your thinking process. It's taking over what you're looking at all the time. It's just taking over your focus, and you're not focused, and pretty soon you realize, I, I'm not seeing, I don't know, where's God? Where's God? I'm not seeing God. And it's just like, let the wind of the Holy Ghost... Let the fire of the Holy Ghost come in and blow the marine layer out. Hallelujah. Because you know when the winds come, the Santa Anas, the offshores, it'll blow that marine layer right out. It'll disperse all those particles and, and, and water vapors and everything that form that cloud and that thing. that's hanging. Some of us, we got things hanging over our life, glory to God, and it's not necessarily always bad. Remember Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, cast every weight and every sin. You know, sometimes weights are just distractions in life. And it's not sin, it's just distractions in life. And notice what it says, Hebrews 12, 1, 2, it says, cast them off. Do you know that's not a, I wonder if I should get rid of this. <laughs> I wonder. No cast off kind of sends a picture is, good gosh. I use my wife as a reference. We lived in Texas for a while. We, when we got to Texas, man, we, coming from Minnesota, we didn't know what fire ants were. <laughs> If you've never experienced fire ant, I thank God, and you don't ever want to experience fire ant. But we moved to Texas, and for some reason, it was like she was a magnet for fire ants. But I can tell you what, when a fire ant would get on her, she didn't go, oh, you nasty little thing. Get off of me. No, it was just like, because they bite, man. And they, they're called fire ants for a reason, because when they bite, it's like fire. And she cast it off. Now, I can tell off on myself, if you've never seen, most of you probably have not, but if you've ever seen me have a spider, and I don't care how big the spider is, 
if you've ever seen me see a spider crawling on me, I don't go, oh, wow. He's just like, get that thing off of me. I'm just telling you. You've got to cast them things off. When you find you're not seen the way God sees... When you find out you're not looking at things the way God sees things, you've got to be serious about it. Living the way God wants us to live requires a little bit of effort. Come on now. Grace is a wonderful thing. But we need to let grace work in our life. And how does grace work in our life? By directing us, guiding us, teaching us, showing us what to do, giving us new vision, giving us new eyesight. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, the Ephesians prayer, well, turn over there. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read this out of the New King James. Uh, Will, just so you bring up the right translation. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 16. This was actually our key text when we started off this series about 2020 vision, seeing the way God sees. Ephesians chapter 1, actually verse 15. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 in the New King James Version. It says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you prayers. Now this is Paul praying for the church. It's the church at Ephesus, but he's praying for the church. How many in here are a part of the church? If you're a part of the church, you don't have to be in Ephesus or be back 2,000 years ago for this to apply to you. Paul is praying for the church. This prayer is as effective now in our lives today, current age, 2020, February 23rd, 2020, as it was back when Paul prayed this and sent the letter to the church at Ephesus. It says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of your prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Do you know he's not talking about your natural eye? He's talking about your spiritual understanding, your spiritual eye. Jesus talks about... Eyes being opened and ears being opened. That's spiritual ears and spiritual eyes. Seeing things differently than the way we see things or have seen things in the natural. That's the whole picture of faith right there. Shared that back a number of weeks ago. But faith is believing in the things that you don't see more than believing in the things that you do see. And I get that's a challenge, but that's why I said it takes a little effort on our part to begin to see things the way God sees them, meaning that even if they're not visible to our natural eye, doesn't make them not true. I said just because we don't see them with our natural eye doesn't make them not true. That's why Paul prayed for the church. He prayed that the eyes of their understanding would be open. What Paul simply was saying here is that our spiritual eyes would begin to have preeminence over our natural eyes. Yeah. What we see in the Spirit, what we see in the Word of God, what we see in Jesus' life is more valuable and more real than what we see with our natural eye. When God says you're healed... What we see in the Word is more real than what we may be dealing with in our physical body right now. Come on now. Come on. Come on. When we see ourselves short in finances, but God says, I blessed you with all heavenly blessings, abundantly, exceedingly, that I've made you to be a blessing because you're an heir of Abraham. And on and on and on the scriptures say that. It's like, yeah, but what I see right now with my natural eye says that the bank account is going to be going into a negative balance. But you see in it the way God sees it, the way God sees you. And that's a challenge. I get that. Matter of fact, many times, if we'll look in the Word of God, we're Word people. We've been taught the Word of God, some of us, for years. Some of us, not as many years. But we're all guilty of this. 
is we'll look in the Word of God and we'll start confessing the Word of God, we'll start speaking the Word of God, we'll start speaking what God says, and we're waiting to see the manifestation. And pretty soon one day goes by, we're not seeing it. Two days go by, we don't see it. Meaning we're not seeing it with our natural eye. Well, the first thing is, is we begin to, we take, our nat, we take our spiritual eye off the promise and we begin to start focusing on the natural eye. I got to see it, I got to see it, I got to see it. Of, and if, we, if we're honest with ourselves, it's like after a couple of days, two days, three days, four days, five days, whatever it is, all of a sudden we're not seeing it with our natural eye and we give up on it with our spiritual eye. Our understanding shifts back over into what we've always known. What are our allegiances to? And what we'll do many times in the case of maybe a, a healing, and how many have ever said this before? Well, I'll just think I'll go to the doctor and see what he says. I just think I'll go to the doctor and see what he says about this. Wait a minute, I thought you already saw what God said about it. Are you saying that we need a second opinion, something that's greater than God? Let, let's apply it to finances. Things in the economy don't look quite right. We're, we're watching, you know, Fox Business Network, and the Dow Jones is going down, or, or they're saying, you know, that this is happening in the tech industry, or this is happening over, over here. And we'll go, I think I'll set a meeting up with my broker, my investor, and see what he has to say about it. Now, am I saying that we don't check in sometimes with things? No, don't, don't run this all into a ditch. But what I'm saying is, is if we check in with God and he begins to speak to us, because remember, we do have the Holy Ghost, which says he's the teacher, he's the counselor, he's the one that knows all things, he's the one that will speak to you and show you things. It's, we're talking about seeing the way God sees. He'll show you and let you see things the way God sees them. And when you know you've heard from him, you don't need to go see somebody in the world. You don't. But we let the circumstances of life, the marine layer of life, begin to cause us is like, I think I need to do something so I can see God. Do you know you don't need to do nothing but just trust? Trust what he said. Trust what he said. Do you know that the United States is 3% of the world's population? United States. The population in the United States makes up 3% of the world population. Do you know the statistics say that 3% consumes 75% of prescription drugs and medication in the world? Do you think something's a little out of whack in the United States? Why do you think that is? Because there's things in our life that allow us to do that. In the countries that don't use that much, they don't have Blue Cross Blue Shield like we do. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with medical insurance or anything like that, but what I am going to say is every time the world gives us another option, the world gives us another thing, is another chance for us to go, we don't need to trust God. Because if you didn't have medical insurance, you wouldn't be running to the doctor at the cost of what doctors are. Come on. Amen. And along with that, with that being said, do you know that the number, now, now, now remember, I'm, I'm talking about we, we, what we do. We want to go see what the investor says or the broker says. We want to go see what the doctor says. We want to go see what our best friend says. We want to go see what the, the latest, greatest motivational speaker is saying. We want to go see things that are outside of the realm or outside of the purpose of God, outside of the Word of God. Well, 3% is what the United States make up. They consume 75% of the drugs that are in the world. Now, we put a lot of stock, obviously, it looks, sounds like, in the medical community. Do you know the statistics say the number three killer in the world? Misdiagnosis by doctors. The only two that supersede it is cancer and heart disease. The next in line is misdiagnosis, which means they don't really know what you got. The odds are pretty slim. They don't really know what you got. 
They're guessing. They're practicing medicine, and in that, they may prescribe you something that'll kill you. Or may not. I'm just, I'm just putting this out here, guys. We need to see the way God sees. How many agree we need to see the way God sees? Yeah. Pastor Dina's mom. This is, a, this is a testo- an actual testimony. This happened about a year ago. She was beginning to deal with some real physical issues. She had major, and I'm just going to say it way this, she had major diarrhea. And she, it kept getting worse, and she was declining and losing weight, and losing weight, and losing weight, and losing weight. She went to this doctor. The doctor said, well, we don't know. Went to this doctor, had this test. Well, we don't know. Went to this, well, we don't know. Went to this doctor, this doctor. I said, well, it could be this. Yeah, let's do this test. Let's do that test. So I said, this, mm, yeah, mm, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. And, and, and all of a sudden, after several months, and she's declining more and more, her weight is going down. She's getting weak. She, she eats. She's got an appetite, but soon, I mean, it's just going through her. And come to find out that several months earlier, she was diagnosed with something. They put her on a new medication. She didn't even have what she was diagnosed with, and the new medication was causing the diarrhea. Yeah, and the Holy Ghost, her mom was a born-again believer. The Holy Ghost showed her some things, and she went to the doctor, and she said, check my medications. And she finally found a doctor that was willing to do it, checked the medication, and said, how long have you been taking this? She said, two months, just as the same amount of time that she'd had the major diarrhea. He said, stop taking it. Who prescribed this to you? We need to see the way God sees to see in God. And she saw the way God saw because the Holy Ghost revealed it to her. So then what she saw by the Spirit of God, she went and shared with her doctor. And she actually had a doctor that was willing to listen to her. Come on now. Talking about the eyes of our understanding being open. That he would grant unto us wisdom and revelation. Well, what is he talking about when it says, Paul saying, grant unto me wisdom and revelation, revealing the truth about the matter. That's the revelation we're looking for. The revelation or the revealing of what's going on. I need to see you, God, in this situation. I need to see what you see. I've got to take my eyes off of the issue and set my eyes on you, and I need to see this the way you see it. And wisdom, what is wisdom? It's not talking about natural wisdom. It's about getting the wisdom and the perspective that God has. That's what it's talking about there. I've got a, a devotion that I found. Just I was preparing, you know, I, I, as we're preparing, Pastor Ian and I and other ministers, when they prepare, they, they look at all different sources. I don't even know who this gentleman is. I just know that he was a pastor. His name is Chip Brogdon. Uh, you can look up stuff from him if you want to. This is the first time I'd ever seen anything from him. It just happened to be on a subject of seeing as God sees. And it's a devotional that he has. And it's uh, this, the key text that he uses for it is John chapter 16, verse 13. It says, he, the spirit of truth, will guide you into all truth. Well, how many know that to see the way God sees, he's got to guide you there? We're not going to see truth with our own understanding. The Holy Ghost needs to guide you into that truth, into God's truth. Because as a, as a human being, we are not wired to just gravitate towards God's truth and God's word and God's ways. Once we get the Holy Ghost on the inside of us, it's easier to gravitate that way, but we still will want to have a tendency to turn and do things our own way. We're kind of trained in society to do things our own way. I mean, it's like our parents train us up so that when you're 18... Uh, learn to live life on your own. You're not living off of our checkbook anymore. Out. Go do this. Live life. Some of us a little bit harsher than others. Some were at 18, man. The, the bag was packed at the front door. I got a friend in Texas. That was way. The day that he turned 18, he said there was a suitcase packed sitting at the front door. He said he looked at his dad and said, what this? He says, you're 18. <laughs> it's time to go out and live life. Well, he's very successful today. 
whether it was the right thing to do or not. He learned how to live life, and he's very successful today, and he's a born-again believer. He's not trying to do it on his own. He's tried to do some things on his own just like we all do. But he's, for the most part, found Christ and started living the way he should be living in a sense of listening to the Holy Ghost, following him, seeing things the way God sees them, trying to take that counsel from the greater one that lives on the inside. He's very successful today. But it says, He, the Spirit of truth, will guide you in all truth. Now, this is the devotion. This is what this pastor says. To choose the truth is to want truth at all costs. To choose the truth is to want it at all costs. We need to ask ourselves, if we want to see the truth, if we want to see the way God sees, are we willing to do it at all costs? Or is it just kind of a casual, yeah, you know, I'm with you today, God, but is it half-hearted? You can live however you want. I'm not, I'm not here to judge you. you. Your relationship with God is the way you have it. But to walk in all truth, to see all truth, it takes an all-in mentality. Whatever that looks like, it takes an all-in mentality. It says, to choose the truth is to want the truth at all costs, even if it means sacrificing everything I have believed up until now, challenging all my paradigms, questioning all my teachers, examining everything I have ever experienced. Remember I shared that back with you a couple of years ago? There was a, a, pastor, or a minister that we know that did this, and it just sparked me. And uh, this minister, if I mention his name, many of you would know him. It has no bearing. But anyways, he said the Lord spoke to him one day and said, everything that you say you believe, go find the truth or the scripture, the truth of God's word to back it up. And if you can't find something to back up that belief, abandon it because it's not a God. That's a challenge. And I challenged our body to it a couple of years ago. I don't know if y'all did it. That's between you and God. But we need to be willing to challenge our paradigms, questioning our teachers, examining everything we've ever experienced. This goes on to say here, of course, our first decision about truth, and this is for all of us. This is for every human being. Our first decision about truth is based upon who Jesus is. That's the first decision you have to make. It is all about Jesus. Because you won't get the truth of God's word unless you put your trust and put your truth in Jesus. Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the life, and the truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said he is truth. So you've got to put your trust in truth. The person, truth. See, truth is a person. It's not just words on a page. Truth is actually a person. And then truth, the person sent truth, the Holy Spirit, to come and live on the inside of you so you'd know the truth. How many know we need to know the truth? How many know the truth doesn't come through worldly knowledge? It can. The world can say things that line up with the Word of God, but they don't know they're lining up with the Word of God. We've got the Word of God to verify whether or not it's truth. So it says, of course, our first decision about truth is based upon who Jesus is. With that question settled, this is interesting. It made me think a little bit, but it's, it's so true because I, I've been serving God for almost 30 years now, and I've seen it, and I've even, the enemy has tried to cause me to become prey to it when I've relaxed my hold on Jesus. Do you know you can all relax? We probably, every one of us in here, have relaxed our hold on Jesus or relaxed our hold on the truth. You can call it whatever you want. It's called getting lazy with the things of God. It's, I'm tired of this. You know, Christianity is tough sometimes. Yeah. There's a saying that we have out on the water, and I've said it in here. It's called, suck it up, buttercup. Yeah. And I don't mean that to be rude or, or hard on anybody, but it's just, it's really the truth. It's just like the, in the world, it would be, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's me, come on, get some backbone, and let, let's go on and do this thing. None of us in here have been like Paul. You ain't been stolen and left for dead. You've not been shipwrecked. You've not been whipped 39 times. Come on. So it's really not as hard as we think, but I, and I, but I get that sometimes when things are coming at you and you feel like all hell's broke loose in your life, you feel like I just... That's when you call on the body of Christ. That's when you call on community. That's one of the reasons for the gathering of the church is, is to build relationship and build community. And when you build that, you've got someone to call on. That's right. 
I mean, that's just one of the reasons why community is so important. But I'll go on reading here. It says, with that, the, the decision for tr about truth is based upon who Jesus is. Once that's settled, who Jesus is, with that question settled, many Christians are content, which means they stop pursuing truth. How many know that once you accept truth, that's not the end of your journey. That's just the start. Right. <laughs> now you've reached the starting point. <laughs> now you've reached the block. <laughs> You're in the blocks of life, and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost, you just received Christ, is like you recognize, wow, Jesus is truth, and I accept him as the Son of God. And when you do that, the Holy Ghost goes, boom, and you leave the starting blocks. Or at least you are to leave the starting blocks. But what he's saying here, many are content. It's like, I'm in a starting block. Wow, I know who Jesus is. And the Holy Ghost goes, boom. And you go, wow, I know who Jesus is. I know, and, have, and all these people are running, man. And you're like, hey, wait for me. But oh, I just love sitting here. I just found out who Jesus is. And you need never leave the starting block. It goes, says, with that question said, many Christians are content, but truth is living. Truth is living, meaning truth is a person. Truth is a person. It's living. It's progressive. It keeps on going. You keep on developing. Yeah. It said the Bible says yeah. that you go from glory to glory. You go from revelation to revelation. The moment you will learn one thing about God, if you keep pursuing him pretty soon, he shows you something else. It's kind of like a mountain. You can look at one side of the mountain all day long, and someone else can be on the other side of the mountain, and you can both have walkie-talkies, and you're like, wow, this side of the mountain, man, there's a stream flowing down, and there's these beautiful trees and I see an elk sitting on the side of the mountain and the guy on the other side says wow I don't know about you man but I don't just see a stream there's a waterfall falling down on this side and there's a whole herd of antelope and there's this and there's that it's like well yeah but it's the same mountain it's just said, what side of the mountain are you on do you know that God wants us to see we're talking about seeing like God. God wants us to see every aspect of the mountain God wants us to go deeper into him. And now once we've seen this side of the mountain, is walk a little farther, it's like, oh my gosh, it's like a diamond. Many of you probably heard this in messages. There's many facets to a diamond, depending on how you turn it in the light and how you switch it and everything like that. It sparkles this way and it shines that way and it throws a prism this way. And it's just like, oh my gosh. It's exactly it. Yeah. Pastor Dina shared back a couple weeks ago about Jesus dazzling you. Does Jesus dazzle you? Do you know for him to dazzle you, you've got to look at different aspects of him and look at different facets of him. It's just like, wow, 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 whoa, hey, oh my, I never, wow, wow. But some of us are content with, wow. And there's nothing wrong with your initial wow. But then there's times where we think in our life, we're just not wowed anymore. Why? Because you stop searching for the wows. It's not like you have to search to find him, but sometimes you have to put forth an effort and search and move and adjust your view and adjust your sight to see a different part of him, to see the way he sees, to go, wow, wow. I, how many have ever you looking in the Word and you're like, I've never seen that before because you just saw another facet. Yeah. You just saw another picture of who God is. Yeah. Yeah. See, God wants us to see like He sees. Yeah. God wants us to see Him for who He really is. But do you know that God is not one-dimensional? God's not even three-dimensional, man. He is just like, wow. But if we, what, what happens is, is because we're designed, we're built, really, in essence, to be dazzled. Yeah. And if we take our eyes off of and our heart and our desire to be dazzled by Jesus, we'll look for something else to dazzle us. In our household, we call it the crow syndrome. If any of you know, crows love shiny, sparkly things. And they'll pick one shiny thing up, and the moment they see another shiny thing, they'll drop that one and they'll go to the next one. And they'll all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We call it in our house the crow syndrome. My wife, she has the crow syndrome. Not in a negative sense, understand. It's just that when we're doing things around the house, or she's doing things, I mean, she'll just be all like, woo, and all of a sudden, it's just like, 
And there's an unfinished project, and it's just like, oh, no, 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 no. and all of a sudden it's like, oh. <laughs> at any given moment, we can have five or six unfinished projects because the Crow syndrome sets in. And I'll always, and, and, and we, I don't even say Crow syndrome, I'll just look, when I see her doing it, I'll just look at her and I'll go, caw, 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 caw. <laughs> and she'll go, oh, shut up. But we do that in life because we're designed that way. God's designed us to see the facets of him and see the wonder of him and the awesomeness of him. And he wants to show you his different facets and he wants to show you. But if we get caught up becoming dazzled with all the things, do you know the world is filled with all kinds of shinies? And those shinies can show up in all kinds of ways. They can show in activities. They can show up in activities. They can show up in people. Do you know that we can become dazzled with just people? Shoot, in the church, we can become dazzled with preachers. It's just like, oh my gosh, so-and-so's coming into town. <laughs> and that's wonderful because you've gleaned something from them before. In Revelation, you know, flows to them. But we need to make sure that it's not about... Uh, my wife and I, where we went to Bible school... The founder of the Bible school that we went to, there were many things that happened through his life and through his ministry. Verifiable, factual things. Supernatural financial miracles, not only in people that he was connected with, but in his own personal life and ministry and in his family. Verifiable, documented things about healings and so on and so forth. Many, many things. Well, because he cared, and, and, and plus the, the revelation that he would share sometimes in the word of God was just like, wow. And there's many people that are, that are born again today and walking with God because of this man's ministry. He's since gone home to be with the Lord. But there was a time, and it was so sad. And we saw it because we're, we went to school, to that school, and graduated from that school. And there were times... He would hold different meetings throughout the sea, a winter Bible seminar, and he would hold a camp meeting and so on and so forth on the campus of the school and where the church is. And uh, during the meeting, because of all the testimonies and everything about this man's life, during the meeting, all of a sudden, he would be led by the Spirit of God to have a prayer line. Maybe for healing or something. And because he was led to do it, he would do exactly what God would show him to do, and he wouldn't do the praying. He'd pick on somebody maybe in, in his staff or in the band that followed him. We actually had one of the speakers. We've had this gentleman in the church, Brother Jim Hockaday, Reverend Jim Hockaday, was part of the singers, Rama Singers and Band. And there were times where, where Kenneth Hagin would turn around and he'd call on Jim and he'd say, Jim, you come down here to land hand. And we actually saw this. There were people that would not come in the prayer line or people get mad at the ministry and at Kenneth Hagin because he wasn't the one. Because they thought, they took their eyes off of Jesus. They weren't seeing the way God sees, which is God will work through anybody if you're a yielded vessel. It's not a, well, I'll work through this person, this person, but I won't work through you. You just need to be a yielded vessel. And when you become a yielded vessel, that simply means that if God calls on you, you say, here I am. It would all behoove us to be better at the moment we get that unction is to go, here I am, instead of going, I wonder if it's God. I don't think it's God. I don't think I can really do that. I don't know how, what happens if I do that. Why do I do that? We talk ourselves right out of it. But I said all that to say this is people will get their eyes on other people. They'll become dazzled by people and miss the anointing. And you'll even become dazzled as you, and, and, and I, I, when I was younger, I did this, is you're believing God for something, you get hands laid on you, and it doesn't feel like you received anything. I've since learned this, that when you're prayed for, you receive. It says, if you believe you received it, it's yours. But because I didn't see with my eyes, then a week or two weeks or whatever, or I'd actually go online and start looking at the different word churches in, in, the, in the area where we were in the, in the Twin Cities and find out if there was a... a Another preacher coming that I esteemed, and it's just like, oh, I know. I didn't get it at my church through my pastor. I'll go to this meeting. 
Because if I go to this meeting, they, they've got a following. And they, they've, I know if I get that. Did you know what? The same power that was in my pastor is the same power that was in that preacher. It's the same power that's in you where you're at right now. If you believe you've got the power in you and you believe you can administer that power and I believe that you've got the power and I believe that I can receive that power, it's no different than if Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagan, uh, Creflo Dollar, or Billy Graham, or whoever else you think is the one that can get you what you need. It's about believing in the Holy Ghost, not believing in the person. Don't become dazzled. You need to be dazzled in the Holy Ghost. You need to be dazzled with Jesus. Amen. You're all carriers of the anointing. You're all carriers of the power. You can put the power on display so that others can see God the way God wants them to see. Do you know that when you guys are doing stuff here around the church and you're doing ministry and you're putting posts out there? Amen. I'll tell you, there's a young lady here right now that it does most of the time our social media. And you know she puts stuff out there on the social media. I see God all the time. It may be a quote from us. It may be something that God showed her. But I see God. When I see you guys doing stuff around here, I see God. I'm seeing the way God sees. I said, I'm seeing the way God sees. Do you see the way God sees? Do you see the person sitting next to you the way God sees them? As a minister of the gospel, is Holy Ghost anointed with power, able to do all things through Christ who gives them strength, able to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover, able to speak with new tongues, all the things that Jesus said a believer would be. Do you, if, if there's a believer sitting next to you, do you see them that way? You say, well, I've never seen them do it before. I'm asking if you've ever seen them do it. Do you see them that way? Do you see yourself that way? Come on. We're talking about seeing the way God sees. You're only going to do the exploits of God until see, when you see the way God sees. It starts with first, Pastor Dean, in the last four weeks, talking about seeing God for who he really is. That he's a loving God, a caring God, a compassionate God, a merciful God, a forgiving God. He was a forgiving God before Christ ever came into the earth, Pastor Dean shared. He was a forgiving God before Christ ever hung on the cross because he had a plan from the beginning of time that he was going to send himself through his son into the earth to forgive a human... Forgiveness was long before Jesus even came into the earth because Abraham, it says that righteousness was accounted unto Abraham because he believed. It was given to him on account, on credit. There were people in the Old Testament, Jesus hadn't even been here. They were forgiven on credit. They were forgiven because they took a little white woolly lamb in there and sacrificed it. And God says, for right now, until my son comes, he, they didn't hear him say, but this, what, that's what God was saying. Until my son comes and finally finalizes this thing, that's going to be sufficient. And I'm going to give you forgiveness on credit. It's only going to be good for a year. So in a year, you're going to have to come back and do this again. But you know what? I'm going to do it. Because I love you that much. Because I care about... You need to start seeing things the way they really are. Once you see God for who He really is, you need to begin to see yourself for who you really are. You're a child of God. You're a child of the King. His DNA is on the inside of you. You say, well, that ain't so. I, yeah, it is. If you're born again, that means you're born of his nature. That means you're born of his DNA. That means you're born of his likeness. You're born of his family. And we'll continue on in the weeks to come about seeing yourself. And then you've got to see the enemy for who he really is. Nothing. He is a defeated foe. But we do have a part to play to remind him and keep him in that place of defeat because he has a right to be here in the earth until Christ comes back. And until that time, he will try to convince you he still has some power and authority. And the only power and authority the enemy has 
We're talking about seeing the way God sees. The only power, the only authority he has is if you relinquish your power and authority that has been given to you by Christ and you relinquish it over to him just like Adam and Eve relinquished it to him. But he can't come and take when he wants. He can't come and steal when he wants. He can't come and do to your body what he wants. He can't come and do to your finances what he wants. You just need to remind him. And I get, there's some times where you get into, you're reminding him and it doesn't seem like he's backing off. But do you know the minute that you remind him, the Bible says that he flees as if in terror. When he hears the word of God and he knows that you're walking in your authority and that you know that you know who you are, and you declare that to him. Now, if he's not leaving, one, it, it may be because you really don't know your authority like you think you know it. And we just need to be honest. I, I get what the word, we know what the word says. But do you know it just here and not here? Because some of it is just mental assent. And that, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes if we're not seeing the results that we want to see, maybe it's just mental assent. Then we need to humble ourselves because the Bible says, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. It says that he gives, in James it says, I believe it's James 4, 7, it says that he gives grace to the humble. If you're willing to, no matter how long you've been saved, because that's sometimes what we can get into as word people. Oh, well, I just know that. I just know the word. I quote the word all the time. Well, good for you. Is it working for you? Well, I'm not getting any results. Well, maybe you don't know the word as well as you think you do. And I apply this to myself. Guys, come on. I'm not saying, what are you doing? I'm, I'm asking myself, and I'm more and more now beginning to ask myself that because it's like, I want to see and experience what God sees and what he said we could experience. And if I'm not experiencing, I want to know why. It's nothing wrong with the source. It's got to be something wrong with the receiver. And it says that if you humble yourself, it says he gives grace to you. What does that mean he gives grace to you? He gives us his favor. He gives us his strength. He gives us his ability. That's what grace is for. Grace is not to live like you want to live. Grace is to live like God intended you to live. <laughs> grace is a person, just like truth is a person. Grace is the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ already did it, and now he wants to do it through you. That's why he knew you couldn't do it on your own. To see what he saw, to do what he did. He said, I've got to come and live on the inside of you, and then if you listen to me and let me live my life through you, you will do what I did. You will see what I saw. You will experience what I experienced. It's that simple. It's just simply checking in with the one that lives on the inside of you. We make this so hard about all the things that we have to do. All the things that we have to we, You better go to church. You better pray. You better read the word. There's nothing wrong with any of them things. But if they ain't getting any results, back off for a minute and go, okay, what's wrong with the picture here? I'm busting my butt and I'm still sick, I'm still broke, and everything in my life seems to be falling apart. Why? Just get before him. See him. Be like Moses. Climb the stinking mountain and get in the presence of God. I didn't say go in your bedroom and open up your Bible. I said climb the mountain and get into the presence of God. Meaning lay aside all of the, this is what I do, 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 uh, and just go, Father, I just want to see you. And I'm not leaving until I see you. And then the challenge will come. Well, that's pretty foolish. You going to spend all day there? If that's what it means to see you. 
And the one who's going to tell you, God ain't going to say, that's pretty foolish, you're going to stay there. The enemy's going to come along and go, you look pretty foolish. Sitting in your room all by yourself. You look pretty foolish. Sitting on that dirt road up in the mountains where it's peaceful, trying to see God. You look pretty foolish. And you may not have to do it to that extreme. You may not have to go to that extreme. That's great if you don't. But are you willing to? Are you willing to go and just say, you know what? And I can tell you this. I'll close with this because it's 25 minutes too. I'll close with this. If you do that, set aside all your what you think you know to do, all your confessions and everything else, and just endeavor to be like Moses. Go to the mountain. You want to see the burning bush. You want to have a burning bush experience. You want to have a Gethsemane experience. You want to have an experience with God. I can guarantee you that he will show himself to you. And it's not quite as hard as what you think. Because the God that we know, the Bible says, is omnipresent. He's everywhere. So if you're serious about looking for him, how many know that when something's everywhere, it's not too hard to find? But yet, it's like, I just don't hear God. I just don't see God. I don't understand. God, why don't I see you? You ain't looking. Because if you're looking, he's right there. And why can't you see him? Because the marine layer's in your life. You're thinking about this. You're thinking about that. You're thinking about this. You're thinking about that. You're thinking about, should I go study the words tomorrow over in this? Should I go see this preacher? Should I go do that? I, what? what huh, ha, hmm, ah, oh, ah, yeah. And the marine layer comes in, and you're like, wow, I sure wish I could see the sun. I'm sick of this gloominess. And just go see God. Go spend time with God. And that can be anywhere. It's not just here at the church. Yes, it's here at the, in these four walls, but it's everywhere you go because God, the Bible says, is omnipresent. So you know what? He's in the parking lot when you walk out. He's in food for less when you go in the grocery store. He's in Walmart. He's where you work. He's in your bedroom. He's in your bathroom. He's in the shower. He's wherever you are, he is. So we should never again, I'm helping somebody here, we should never again go, God, I just don't see you. We should go, why am I not seeing him? Because the Bible tells me he's everywhere. All the time. And if he's everywhere all the time, he should be easy to see. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Father, that we are growing. Now, yeah. We are growing and we are seeing the way you're seeing. I believe right now by the power of the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus that there is spiritual understanding and our spiritual eyes are being opened. We're not blinded to the things of God. We were blinded to the things of God when we didn't know Jesus. Bible says that the enemy blinds the minds or blinds the eyes of those that don't know Christ. But even through that, through him trying to blind people, the light, the light of the gospel lifts or can penetrate through them shields. Hallelujah. There's a 